and Implementation Science. My name is Christopher Thrall, I'm the Communications Officer with CPSI, and I'll be your MC for the webinar. I'd like to welcome you on behalf of our web host, Tricia Swartz, CPSI Patient Safety Improvement Lead, and our technical host, CPSI Project Coordinator, Gina Peck. Our call today is the final one in this informative six-part series. In this discussion, we will focus on the importance of understanding the problem before brainstorming solutions to better ensure a match between the barriers that exist and your solutions you come up with. While this series is best enjoyed as a whole, you are always welcome to attend any one, several, or all six webinars in the series. If you miss a webinar and you want to catch up, please know that all are recorded and available on our website the week following their webcast date. It gives me and CPSI inestimable pleasure to introduce our speakers for this webinar, Dr. Jeremy Grimshaw and Dr. Justin Presseau. Dr. Grimshaw received a Bachelor of Medicine, Bachelor of Surgery degree from the University of Edinburgh in the United Kingdom. He trained as a family physician prior to undertaking a PhD in health services research at the University of Aberdeen. He moved to Canada in 2002. Dr. Grimshaw's research focuses on the evaluation of interventions to disseminate and implement evidence-based practice. Jeremy is a senior scientist in the Clinical Epidemiology Program at the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute, a full professor in the Department of Medicine at the University of Ottawa, and a Tier 1 Canada Research Chair in Health Knowledge Transfer and Uptake. He is a corresponding fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Dr. Justin Prosseau has a PhD in Psychology from the University of Aberdeen. He has been awarded Early Career Awards from the UK Society for Behavioural Medicine, the International Society of Behavioural Medicine, and the European Health Psychology Society. He is an Associate Editor for journals Implementation Science and Applied Psychology, Health and Wellbeing. Dr. Plasseau is a scientist at the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute as well, and an assistant professor in the School of Epidemiology and Public Health and the School of Psychology at the University of Ottawa. He is the scientific lead for knowledge translation at the Ottawa Methods Centre. Dr. Plasseau's research pro program operates at the intersection between health psychology and implementation science. He draws upon behaviour change theories and methods to understand factors that promote and undermine behaviour change in healthcare settings, and then designs and evaluates theory-based strategies for promoting healthcare professional behaviour change to increase best practice and reduce novel evidence to practice in healthcare. Dr. Grimshaw and Dr. Prosseau will talk for approximately 40 minutes, allowing us 15 minutes at the end for questions and conversation. So please write your questions and your comments in the question and answer box or the chat box, and they will be compiled and provided to our speakers at the end of the call. If you run into IT difficulties, please connect with us in the chat or question and answer box, and we would be happy to assist. Without further ado, CPSI is delighted to welcome our speakers for today for their final appearances in this webinar series, Drs. Jeremy Grimshaw and Justin Prosseau. Thanks so much, as always, for the very kind introduction, and uh, welcome to those of you who are just joining us for the first time in this last one, welcome. Uh, we'll walk you through where we're at, and for those of you uh, joining us uh, for, for the sixth out of the sixth, uh, thanks for following us along uh, over these past few months. and it's. Uh, I feel like we've gotten to know you over the, the, these past few months, despite not actually seeing any of you, but uh, looking forward to your, any questions you might have uh, at the end. So let me dive into this, uh, our last uh, webinar, focused on selecting strategies and techniques uh, best suited to address the barriers and enablers that we've been talking about over the past few webinars. So uh, just to uh, give you a quick overview, I'm going to start by just situating ourselves as we, we tend to do with our progress along the webinar series itself, and then I'll hand it over to Jeremy, who's going to talk us through some tools that can, we can use to select strategies, how we can then map various enablers to, uh, to strategies, uh, and some tools that, to consider for reporting intervention descriptions. Um, it's always just a, a sort of a reminder that our lens is a distinctly behavioral one with the, the, the premise that any successful implementation of a patient safety program needs someone to do something differently whether it be patients, health providers, managers, or policymakers, um, they need to change what they do and the decisions that they make uh, in the healthcare environment. Um, and with that lens, um, we can start to draw on the substantial evidence base that we have in the behavioral sciences to support the development of uh, safety programs and hopefully increase the likelihood of their success. And uh, with this last um, webinar, hopefully we'll, we'll highlight some of the value of, of taking this behavioral approach to allow us in particular to 
link barriers enablers to fit for purpose strategies for those particular uh, identified barriers. And so this slide just highlights where we're at, the final webinar. Um, and then I'll just take a couple of minutes to, to resituate ourselves using the knowledge to action framework that we've been using all along. So um, for those of you who are on the, the second webinar, as you'll recall, Jeremy walked us through the, the middle of the, the KTA process, the, the knowledge creation funnel, which uh, by the end of it uh, seeks to produce uh, high quality evidence base or, or, or knowledge to be implemented, whether it be a review, a systematic review, a clinical practice guideline, a decision aid, or a policy brief. Um, but hopefully by now we've convinced you that um, whilst fundamentally important to produce this evidence base, um, merely disseminating it doesn't necessarily um, lead to uh, implementation, um, which is where the, the, the outer circle or the action cycle comes in. So webinar three, we drill down into given the evidence that we've created, what are the gaps between that evidence base or the suggested performance and what is currently being done in practice um, to identify the problem? Um, and really drilling down into who needs to do what differently. Um, and we proposed a, a tool to, to help work through that, so the target action, context, time, and actor TACTA tool um, to really uh, identify whose who's actors, whose behavior we're actually talking about. And again, there's a temptation here that once we've identified the problem that we might already have some, some rumblings of solutions in our mind that how to, on how to address these problems, but our suggestion is to then before jumping straight to solutions to, to um, really understand the barriers um, that may come up so that the solutions are fit for purpose. And so we spent webinar four and five uh, per, uh, introducing uh, a particular theoretical framework, the theoretical domains framework, uh, as a basis for exploring and identifying the possible barriers and enablers um, that may get in the way. Um, and um, and provided some practical approaches on how you might go about doing that. So the, the result of that is, is really a list of theory-linked barriers and enablers that can be used as a basis for identifying strategies. And that's really where this next uh, and final webinar is focused. And how do we then move on to selecting the strategies once we've identified the, the barriers and enablers? Um, as always, we're using hand hygiene as our case study. And, and by now, you'll have seen the slide six times for those of you who've been with us all along, so I won't dwell on it, but just to say this is a an ongoing problem or an ongoing issue that um, deserves, I think, new, uh, additional attention and possibly new lenses and uh, potentially a behavioral approach might be one way to do that. And so um, we talk through uh, who needs to do what differently. The step one of the French model, we use the TACTA to identify, for example, the action use alcohol-based hand gel. The actors would be staff, physicians, nurses, and residents. The target of that action could be patients receiving care at a hospital. Uh, the context might be um, using the hand gel in the patient rooms and the hallways, and the time might be before and after touching the patient. That would lead us into step two, what are the barriers and enablers, and we might use the theoretical domains framework to identify these. So here's a couple of examples of quotes that um, have been identified and published on by Janet Squires and colleagues uh, exploring this issue with, with physicians in hospital settings. So a few quotes from um, knowledge identified that some felt that they, or reported that they weren't aware of uh, hand hygiene guidelines and hadn't heard of the four moments of hand hygiene. They weren't aware uh, of any evidence linking hand hygiene to hospital-associated infections, um, but they highlighted that education about hand hygiene can ensure that they practice consistently. That's separate from beliefs about capabilities, so some reported that it was easy to do, but others reported not feeling confident that they're actually following um, hand hygiene guidance when they engage in hand hygiene practices. Neatly within this study, they engaged in observations alongside the interviews with the, um, the physicians, um, and they, which served to confirm what came through the interviews, where they identified from an environmental context and resource perspective that some of the dispensers were sometimes empty, um, that the dispensers themselves were of a color that blended with the wall, so it didn't really stand out, um, and the bottle baskets next um, that, that had uh, sanitizers in rooms were sometimes empty. Um, highlighting some environmental issues. Uh, and moving on to beliefs about consequence examples, practicing hand hygiene reduces, they felt, you know, reduces the transmission, so they are uh, on the same page as what the evidence suggests. Uh, but some are also suggesting that whilst improper hand hygiene can contribute to infection, it's not the only factor that can do so, so highlighting that there are other reasons. Um, and highlighting practicing hand hygiene gives patients confidence in their position. So mainly enablers when we're talking about beliefs about consequences. This setting. 
those are just just a flavor of the distinct types of barriers that might come through when um, uh, investigating this, um, which then leads to once you have these these barriers and enablers and you identify those that you want to prioritize, how do you then select strategies that are fit for purpose for those identified barriers and enablers? And I'll pass it over to Jeremy to take us through that. Okay, thanks, Justin. Um, good morning and good afternoon to everyone on the call. It's great to join you again. Uh, so. Um, one of, the, one of the kind of uh, emerging sort of um, uh, uh, agreements in, when we're thinking about designing improvement programs is that we need to base them on certain different types of, <coughs> of, of information. Uh, a diagnostic assessment of the barriers, that's kind of what we've talked about, in particularly in uh, uh, the webinars four and five. Uh, understanding the mechanism of the action of the interventions. If you identified um, you know, a particular barrier, say that uh, uh, clinicians don't feel that um, uh, they know how best to wash their hands, uh, uh, to, comp uh, to comply with guidelines, uh, what interventions will actually sort of uh, address that particular barrier, the empirical evidence about the effects of interventions, and then very practical issues, what resources do we have in the system that, would, uh, that we could lever, and all the practicalities and, and logistics, these logistical issues. Um, it's, it's kind of clear that when we look at the, these problems, um, it's not that there's a single right way to do a strategy for addressing the barriers and enablers. Um, often we identify many, many more barriers and enablers than we could possibly address. And at other time, uh, and what we often have to do is make choices about which are the key barriers and enablers that we think uh, um, um, should be addressed, uh, um, uh, and then use that to think about what are the best uh, uh, strategies and techniques to address those barriers. Um, when I'm talking, I often talk about um, uh, or use cooking analogies. Um, and so uh, if we're thinking about cooking a, a rack of lamb, we could use you know, virtually anything in our, in our, um, uh, in our kitchen. Um, but some of them work particularly well. We know that, say, rosemary and thyme and garlic you know, really sort of uh, uh, um, go well with, 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 uh, 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 with um, um, lamb. Some of them probably not so much. And so again, what we're trying to do here is find out sort of basically, you know, what are the right ingredients that will give us a sort of best uh, 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 way to address the intervention, and not to always think that more will be better. You know, just by putting more and more herbs and spices on your lamb will not make it better if they're kind of mismatched. So, you know, what we're trying to do here when we're designing implementation interventions is select ingredients that are best suited for addressing um, our key barriers. Uh, so how do we do it? What, 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 are, what, are, what do we have in our, in our larder, in our toolkit? Uh, well, we have a number of sort of different classifications of uh, you know, potential interventions that we could, um, uh, uh, that could help us think through you know, what, what, what we might want to do. Uh, and we're going to talk these through very quickly. Um, so, so the first one is sort of, um, 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 you know, when we're thinking about strategies select, just coming back, the idea there's no magic bullet, um, there's no one thing that will address uh, all the potential barriers. We have to sort of decide which interventions will actually address um, the specific barriers and enablers. Um, it's helpful for us to be explicit. Again, one of the things we often find is that people say, oh, we'll do some education without a real clarification in terms of what they mean by that. So what will be covered in the education? What will, uh, when will it be delivered? How do they anticipate that the practitioners will be engaged with that? Um, and also, um, Again, sometimes see, see, uh, people see that uh, doing, um, uh, we'll do some education is an intervention, whereas actually if you're going to organize some uh, continued professional development activities uh, that have an educational component, you could use that to change knowledge, to change people's um, beliefs about consequences, or to improve people's skills, or change people's views about um, uh, social influence or their professional role. So uh, again, we often find it's helpful to try and distinguish um, uh, the what, it's a content, the active ingredients of the intervention from how we're going to actually deliver them. So we found it useful to distinguish what we're trying to change. This is where we, there's kind of tag to formulation that uh, uh, Justin has highlighted the useful. Um, what, why are we trying to change it and what are the kind of key enablers and barriers and how are we going to change it including what we're calling here the behavior change techniques which are often the sort of active ingredients of, of the behavior change component and the method of delivery, so how will we actually engage the healthcare professionals, and then the content, and what are the kind of particular elements that we want to make sure get covered in our interventions. 
Um, so, yeah, one of the issues is that when we're thinking about kind of these uh, knowledge translation or implementation interventions, uh, uh, um, in the literature, they're often not particularly well described. And as I've said, we often are not very well at uh, you know, defining them in sufficient detail in our own setting that would allow us to replicate them, which might create problems that if, for example, you do an intervention in a, 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 a set of general medical wards in your, in your, in your hospital, uh, they, you, know, you may not have actually described the intervention in sufficient detail, but if another manager or person wants to pick these up and move them into the surgical wards, they, they may be able to actually use them. So here are kind of a, a couple of uh, a taxonomies that actually give us the layout what our toolkit may look like. And um, the Cochrane Effective Practice and Organization of Care Group is a group in, in the Cochrane Collaboration that undertakes systematic reviews of interventions to improve healthcare systems and healthcare delivery. And to help organize their work, they've identified uh, or created a taxonomy of potential interventions. And some of these are focusing on you know, basically addressing the healthcare worker or addressing the organization, addressing coordination of care, or who provides role care or, or information communication technology interventions. So this gives you a kind of a, a broad view of, um, of, of, of potential interventions that we might want to use um, if we try to sort of think about uh, improving quality of care and safety. But what we would say, uh, or one of the comments just that I would say, is that yeah, these are often more about methods of delivery. So as we've already said, educational meetings is a method of delivery. It's bringing people together for a seminar, a workshop, but it really doesn't tell us about how, what the active ingredients are within that workshop. Um, doing academic detailing or educational outreach visit, again, is a, a method of delivery rather than um, a, a detailed description of what we need to do. So whilst this is very useful as a, very, as a high level organizing framework, um, um, you know, we often have to actually sort of provide more detail and think more clearly about what we're trying to achieve with, say, an educational meeting. There's another taxonomy called the ERIC taxonomy that was developed by Baron Powell and colleagues. And you know, again, they were trying to address the fact that um, you know, the language here is problematic. There are lots of sort of overlapping sort of uh, 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 terms used to describe different interventions. And so they used the Delphi technique and came up with 73 discrete implementation strategies. And they just list them alphabetically, uh, which may not be as helpful as, say, the epoch taxonomy that Lisa says, okay, we want to focus on healthcare workers. What can we do? But you'll see there's a fair amount of, um, of, of, of overlap. So they have conduct educational meetings, conduct educational outreach, outreach visits. Um, and the, um, the kind of criticism we made of the epoch tax on it would, would hold here that uh, it probably doesn't give us enough detail about well, what is it that we should be doing as part of our educational meeting. So the, you know, recognizing this gap that often what we describe as kind of our methods of engagement or delivery of interventions from not the active ingredients. Uh, one of our colleagues, Susan Meekey, who's a professor of health psychology in uh, uh, University College London in the UK, uh, basically developed an international uh, consensus on what, are the, what, what she called behavior change techniques. In other words, what's the minimum uh, uh, um, behavior change active ingredient that we may have? And you can see that um, what they, they, when they looked at this, identified 93 different ways in which uh, uh, um, psychologists and other behavior change um, experts are used if they're trying to change behaviors. And these are much more focused on the active ingredient rather than the method of delivery. And so what we often want to do is bring together the EPOC or the ERIC taxonomies of this is how we, uh, uh, we're going to try and engage with our, our, our group of stakeholders with the behavior change taxonomy, which gives us a much more fine-tuned uh, 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 or, or, or granular view of uh, of potential interventions. And these are the 93 um, interventions, not anticipating that you'll actually uh, look through these, but um, you'll see they're organized into uh, uh, 16 different high groups. So uh, there are a number of interventions that are about how we can provide feedback or monitoring. Uh, there are a number of, feed, uh, of interventions about um, how do you get uh, um, uh, individuals or groups to set goals and make plans. Uh, others about sort of um, um, uh, 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 increasing um, um, uh, um, uh, 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 skills within within, um, uh, within within interventions. Now, within the behavior change taxonomy, uh, each intervention ha or each technique has a definition and a, an example 
uh, uh, to provide that. So it's actually a very rich source of ideas for different change processes. So for example, the, there's a behavior change technique called demonstration of the behavior. And this is particularly good if you want to try and um, uh, change beliefs about capabilities or potentially skills. And here you provide an observable sample of performance of the behavior directly, in person, or indirectly, uh, which will include modeling. Um, and yeah, so, so it gives you a sort of sense about you know, what that might look like. Um, so you might sort of, for example, uh, as an example here, demonstrate to nurses how to raise the issue of, of drinking with patients via role play exercise. So each of these behavior change techniques gives, has a definition and some further examples about how you might want to use them. And as I said, I think this gives a really good um, set of ideas about uh, you know, what we can do to try and change the behaviors of our different stakeholder audiences. Um, this last uh, um, um, uh, 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 checklist is called the tidy checklist. And this is just a, a tool to help you be much more clear in your, descri in your description of what you're doing, which would allow you to um, both replicate it locally, communicate with your know, colleagues in other settings about what you did, uh, and, and potentially also if you're doing this in a quality improvement or a research perspective, you know, uh, uh, to help you write up um, your, your experience uh, much more clearly. And basically, it sort of uh, um, provides a series of headings that uh, you might want to use if we're describing a, a change process, um, you know, provide a brief name, and um, say why, which is really kind of what some excellent action that we think would be useful to address the barriers. What are the materials that you provided? What procedures? Who did it? How, where, when, and how, et cetera. And so this is very helpful that if you're trying to sort of communicate your, your, your ideas to other people in your environment or outside your environment, being very clear about these components is um, potentially very useful. So just to summarize this, this Piece. Um, taxonomies provide a shared language for describing our interventions, and they help promote clarity, and that helps uh, with our intervention fidelity, replication, optimization, and they may give us new ideas about um, how to design and describe uh, um, interventions. Um, what they don't do, though, is they're not necessarily linked then to um, how we actually, uh, or which barriers and enablers uh, and they address. So uh, when we had the example of demonstration of the behavior, um, in the definition, it didn't tell us which barriers and enables that was useful for. I suggested it might be useful if you want to um, address um, the least of our capabilities or skills. So I was sort of uh, away from outside the taxonomy, starting to um, identify which barriers and enables these interventions might be useful. So, so what we have uh, 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 to this stage is we've got a, a way using the theoretical domain framework of identifying the key barriers and enablers. And we have the behavior change techniques and also our, our, our delivery mechanism taxonomies as a way of thinking about what the intervention might be. And what we'd like now is to have a better link to sort of say, okay, in the face of certain uh, or, or specific barriers and enablers, which interventions or, or behavior change techniques might be most useful. And here again, uh, we have the ability to build, a oh, okay. Sorry, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, I'll come back to that that um, that comment in a uh, in a minute. Um, so, so just sort of, um, uh, um, yeah, when we think about selecting our interventions, we want to do it on the uh, uh, our understanding of the barriers, thinking about the mechanisms of, of, of action of uh, our interventions, but also the empirical evidence. Um, so, you know, one of the one of the real strengths and opportunities of this area is that we actually have a lot of information already out there. Um, so I've already mentioned the uh, uh, Cochrane Effective Practice and Organization of Care Group. And they currently have over 200 reviews and protocols uh, uh, um, about how you do change processes to improve um, healthcare uh, uh, um, delivery and healthcare uh, uh, systems. Um, so we know quite a lot. And if we're thinking about planning interventions, we should go out and sort of basically try and um, um, build upon these, uh, uh, this knowledge base um, as part of our planning process. This is kind of a summary of um, what we know for, uh, across a range of different change approaches. So providing uh, prompts or reminders on paper. Um, so this would be sort of, for example, um, um, a structured checklist or a, a flow sheet for um, you know, following patients with a chronic condition. Uh, there was a review by our DT running in 2012 and that showed basically about uh, 32 trials and the reminders alone 
led to about 11% absolute improvement in performance with an interquartile range of uh, 7 to uh, 20 percent. If you look at just printed education materials, so this will be where we send um, guidelines or points out to uh, colleagues there. They do, there are seven randomized control trials. They do lead to a small improvement in performance of potentially 2 percent with an interquartile range of 0 to 11 percent, but clearly not of the same order effect we're seeing with some of the other interventions. If we want to look at on-screen point of care reminders, um, um, this, there's a review published in 2009 by Carve Shijania from Toronto. Uh, this is currently being updated, and there's now many more trials. By 2009, there are 28 randomized controlled trials, and we saw an improvement of about 4% in absolute terms with an interquartile range of 1% to 19%. So you get a sense that we have lots of things that in general work. And again, it brings us back to, well, you know, what intervention is going to be best for our particular setting? Um, but if we could choose those interventions where we're getting, for example, with reminders, you know, more than 10 percent absolute improvement, that would be, you know, quite a remarkable achievement. So we have quite a lot of, of, of information that we can, we can use. Building upon this also, we can sort of start to say within the systematic reviews, you know, are there any signals about how we can optimize the intervention? So if we're thinking about using feedback in our, uh, uh, as part of our uh, improvement interventions, um, the Cochrane review sort of um, clearly shows that audit feedback in general works. You get about a 4% absolute improvement in performance with an interquartile range of 1% to 16%. But it also identified you got large effects if baseline compliance was low, if the source was a supervisor or colleague, if it's provided more than once, if it's delivered in both verbal and written formats, and if it included both explicit targets and an action plan. So that if you're planning feedback, uh, a feedback intervention, you'd want to see you know, uh, how many of these sort of um, boxes you could tick in the design and delivery of the feedback you've got to try and increase the likelihood that you're going to have a, you know, basically a, a large effect than just 4%. Um, we can also get a, 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 a further information from from theory, from, from theory that might, again, give us ideas about how we might want to optimize uh, uh, our interventions. So this was work that was undertaken by um, a colleague of ours, Jamie Brijo, and he interviewed 30 world experts uh, in feedback from a broad range of areas, including, say, organizational, psych uh, organizational sciences, cognitive psychology, education, um, health and social psychology, uh, to sort of say, how could we optimize audit feedback? And they, the, the experts identified over 300 different ways in which we could you know, potentially improve audit feedback, but we identified for this paper um, 15 low-hanging fruit, 15 things that we thought there was uh, enough either evidence or theory suggested if you're designing audit feedback now, you might want to try and follow this guidance. And so some of these things um, you know, uh, relate exactly or back to the uh, Cochrane view. Audit feedback is more likely to be effective if it's provided multiple times. If you present feedback as soon as possible after the, the practice has been observed, if you can provide individual rather than general data, if you include clear comparators that reinforce desired behavior change, um, if you can minimize the cognitive load, I often think with feedback, you know, basically clinicians should be able to look at a feedback uh, report and within five seconds understand in general how that performance compares to you know, their colleagues or, or some form of standard. If it's going to take me 30 seconds to understand it, then you've probably lost me already. So these are kind of, again, a set of suggestions about how we might want to optimize um, uh, uh, um, um, an audit feedback intervention, that if we're planning to use feedback as part of our intervention, um, which might be particularly useful if, um, uh, for uh, things like uh, addressing behavioral regulation, then we'd want to sort of basically um, uh, uh, take these into account. So just to give you a summary, systematic reviews are a good source of identifying strategies that to be effective cross settings. Um, but yeah, the, the issue we face again is that in general we know these things work, but often what we're trying to do is make sure there's a good fit between your problem, your context, with the intervention you're choosing. Um, and that's where we again need to think through you know, to what extent the different interventions might address the barriers and enablers. Okay. I'm Going to move on to the work I was indicating earlier, which is the work that, uh, again, Susan Meek and colleagues have done. And this is very much a proof of principle idea. Um, they would argue that 
Now, Susan is a very, very serious scientist, but she would argue that this is a, really a demonstration of what could be done, but it needs further development at this point in time. But just and I wanted to present this to you as an example of you know, where we're trying to get to uh, in terms of sort of uh, um, building up the science of uh, knowledge translation implementation, and that this is a continually evolving field that um, hopefully over time our knowledge, our tools will become much more practical for people. So um, Susan, uh, um, uh, as part of a thought experiment, said, okay, we will take the theoretical domains framework and we'll take an early version of the behavior change techniques and we want to ask people or a group of uh, behavior change experts to you know, basically try and come to a consensus about whether a particular behavior change technique might be useful if you're trying to address beliefs in a specific um, domain. And she came up with what is affectionately known as the matrix. And this is what you have uh, on the screen at the moment. Um, and I'll just walk you through it. So the columns are basically uh, um, the different theoretical domains framework. And you can see at the, uh, 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 um, there's a little, uh, 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 um, or, or, or the, uh, um, sorry, at the bottom of the, at the bottom of the, of the, of the, of the table, it tells you what each of the columns are. So column three relates to skills. So if you had identified that you wanted to, or you needed to change uh, professional skills to address and the intervention, you can look down column three. And the white boxes are those behavior techniques that um, uh, the, the experts agreed would be helpful if you want to try and change um, um, skills. So for example, the top three boxes are specify a goal or target, monitoring or self-monitoring. So if you want people to change their skills, all of those things might be helpful. The crosshatch boxes are, boxes are where you know, basically they thought these things would not be helpful. So getting people to sign up to a contract is not going to be particularly helpful if you want to, um, uh, if you want to uh, uh, change people's skills. And the black boxes are where people disagreed, and the vertical line boxes are um, uh, uh, where sort of basically people didn't feel like there's enough information at this point in time to come to any form of judgment. But if we go back to skills, what this allows us to say is across these sort of you know, these uh, 30 to 40 sort of behavior change techniques, we can identify those behavior change techniques that might be helpful. So I've already mentioned goal or target specification, monitoring or self-monitoring, uh, rewards, graded tasks, increasing skills, rehearsal rather than skills, um, to modeling, demonstration behaviors by others, homework, uh, use of imagery, sorry, performing behavior in a different setting, simulation. All of these things might be useful for changing skills. So. If you've got a skill-based uh, uh, barrier, this is, the, uh, this is your shortlist about, well, what are the active ingredients we want to include in an intervention to, um, to improve things? If, on the other hand, you want to change people's motivation and goals, you've got a set of clinicians who, you know, basically are not committed to trying to do the behaviors you're interested in, we'd look down column six. And here we see that, well, specific goal and target might be helpful for those. Um, providing rewards, graded tasks, increasing skills might be helpful. Um, environmental changes, social process of encouragement, pressure and support, persuasive communication, and um, motivational imaging, uh, interviewing might all help, again, if that's what you want to change. So this gives you, um, um, you know, basically it gives you a sort of short list of things you should be thinking about depending on the, um, depending on the, um, um, sorry, uh, uh, depending on, on um, uh, depending on, on the barrier that you're facing. And what I'd like to do is to, sorry, we're just having a problem with this. Okay, we'll get back to the slides. And what we, what I, you know, if we go back to the cooking analogy, I say the, the, this gives us that, those kind of ideas about what goes well. So if you're cooking lamb, rosemary, garlic, anchovies, thyme. Um, if you're cooking um, um, pork, uh, aniseed, fennel, whatever, whatever else you've got there. It doesn't tell you how to actually roast the leg of lamb, um, but it tells you here's what you should think about for your, your active ingredients. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so, 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 so some of the last thing, it's the last couple of slides I wanted to talk about is also just the idea about trying to um, uh, 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 ensure or use design principles to, again, uh, uh, try and optimize your behavior change uh, or your change program before you introduce it in, in the real world. You could have gone through uh, um, this process and identified all, you know, all the barriers and enablers. You might have very carefully designed uh, or chosen which interventions and delivery mechanism would best address those interventions. But if, you start, if your intervention is then not incorporated into uh, the kind of work processes or the availability of the, the stakeholders you're trying to change, then your intervention might fundamentally fail. And so we need to sort of make sure that when we're thinking about designing interventions, we're also thinking about how will this work fit into the workplace? What are the kind of things that we can use in the workplace that might allow us, you know, for, for this intervention to be more easily taken up? You know, how do we actually sort of uh, uh, um, make sure that um, it, we don't fail because we've got unrealistic expectations about, you know, the availability of clinician time, for example, to engage in interventions? And we're increasingly working with, um, with uh, uh, and process engineers, human factors, and, and design people uh, to, to use human factors approaches. So having designed our, you know, our, 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 our theory-informed change intervention, then work with them to decide how can we actually deliver this in a real-world setting to increase the likelihood of change. And the key things here are that um, you know, human factors approaches design, uh, th design programs for the way people are, not the way we wish they are. We often think, well, you know, if only clinicians could spend half a day to come and learn about this new procedural technique, not recognizing that they're incredibly busy and that that just would be very hard if you had a, a, for them to achieve uh, or to, for everyone in the team to achieve that. And also, you want, uh, often process uh, um, uh, 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 engineering will allow us to think about adapting systems to people rather than expecting people to adapt to systems. And what we're aware of is that many quality and safety uh, um, programs, particularly in larger hospitals, there's often this expertise here, and what we find is particularly helpful is you know, bringing that strong theoretical basis about you know, how and why we're thinking about changing behavior to the sort of the, the, uh, the human factors, uh, 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 through a human factors lens to make sure that we're actually delivering them in a way uh, that can make sense in, in a real world uh, setting. So we want to come back to um, our description about, or, or just talk through what we did with our and hygiene example in the Ottawa Hospital. Um, so this was a protocol, but we also published uh, the Bias and Facilitators work in um, the Journal of uh, uh, FG and Hospital Infection. So um, we've already talked about sort of going out and identifying what the barriers are. Uh, and then what we did after that is we started to sort of basically map the, the key barriers we identified against potential change approaches to think about um, you know, how we might be able to deliver an intervention. So we, we sat around with our team, which included the infection control group from the hospital that had hygiene champions, and talked through what we know from behavior change approaches might be helpful, and you know, talked with them about what they thought would be helpful and might uh, fit into the environment. And we ended up with an intervention that focused on five specific domains where we were particularly interested in uh, um, um, you know, addressing knowledge issues, skill issues, the least about consequences, memory attention, decision-making processes, and social influences. Um, and we were kind of thinking about feasibility and acceptability of our intervention. And one of the things that came out is we had slightly different um, uh, intervention delivery than medicine and surgery. Uh, in surgery, we were able to sort of deliver uh, uh, an intervention during the routine surgical rounds. That wasn't seen as being appropriate for medicine. So this is where, you know, in particular, these very practical issues and constraints came in. Um, so we'd, we'd you know, done our diagnostic assessment of barriers. We'd identified the, the behavior change techniques we want to use. We'd thought about the empirical evidence about the effects of interventions. But what was particularly clear, particularly when we were talking to physicians and, and chief residents in medicine, is that um, hand hygiene was seen as a relatively low priority for physicians. And so if we, you know, if we suggested putting on any you know, special events or, or um, education sessions around um, um, uh, hand hygiene for uh, physicians working in medicine, it was unlikely they'd turn up. You know, we asked, could we actually use our, our medical grant rounds to have a session specifically on audit and feedback? 
and we're told, you know, in general, people wouldn't uh, wouldn't choose to turn up for this. It's not particularly interesting or sexy when there are lots of calls on people's times. We said, what happens if people provide pizza uh, or um, other sort of uh, uh, refreshment for them? Yeah, you know, would they turn up? And they sort of said, well, they'd probably turn up and take the pizza and leave, or they'd sit, turn up and they'd sort of sit at the back and, uh, and do their notes. Um, so we were kind of a bit stuck with that. So the next idea we had was, you know, is this something we could introduce during sort of handover, you know, in, in the mornings uh, when sort of, you know, residents going off shift or, uh, or, 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 or residents going off shift and new residents are coming on? Um, and we we're told that this would be a very, very bad idea. You know, you've got a group, group of residents who are tired and they've got a, a lot of important information they're trying to get across to new residents and the new residents need to, you know, basically get running to, you know, sort out um, um, their work during the day. So that would really not be a good idea. So I remember we had a, a, we were having a meeting with our chief medical residents and said, well, how on earth can we engage with, 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 with both the residents and attending? Are there any opportunities where they kind of get together? We might be able to sort of somehow, you know, be involved or, or, or present some work about hand hygiene. And um, the chief resident said, well, actually, you know, every time we have resident hand uh, turnover, which is about once a month, we have a half hour, you know, early morning briefing with them about what the expectations are within this particular ward or, or, or service. Um, and we said, oh, that's great. Do you think we could come and talk to them during that half hour? And they said, no, <laughs> we're much too busy. We've actually got 30 things we're trying to get across them, and we don't want you coming and sort of, you know, basically sort of taking up five minutes, because that means that we'll only get through 22 of the things we want to get through to them. But then one of the chief residents said, well, you know, there are these two slides that we no longer really, you know, we really don't have to talk to people about them. Um, you know, kind of that, the issue they're addressing is no longer relevant to us. So you can have two slides. And this was the first time anyone had said, here's a way that you could reach out to, you know, the clinical audience. So we said, great, we'll take them. Um, and, but what we agreed was that actually the chief residents would, would deliver the content of the slides. Uh, but we would provide the slides to them. And then another, the other chief resident said, well, the other time when we all get, get together and the attendings also attend is during our antibiotic stewardship rounds. So once a week on the medical services in the order hospital, there's an antibiotic stewardship round where an infectious disease physician will attend the ward and talk through difficult cases with both the attendings and the residents. And the chief re resident said, you yeah, know, people go to that because it's really helpful to them. Um, yeah, and we get both attending and residents there. And if you do something in that setting, you're likely to get both a lot of people, and uh, it's going to be very relevant within the nature of discussion about use of antibiotics and infection control more generally. So fortunately, we're working with the uh, the infectious disease physicians who did the antibiotic um, uh, um, shooting rounds. So we said, would you be willing to think about you know have um, introducing some hand hygiene messages? Into your um, into your um, um, your, your antibiotic shooting rounds, and they thought this was a good idea. They wanted it to be flexible, so they wanted to be able to say, well, depending on what happens, if we have a, a, a hospital-acquired infection outbreak, then we're going to have to focus on that. So we might not do any hand hygiene during that week. But you know, if you give us some idea about what we want, you want us to cover off, then we'll we'll basically work it through. And so what we did was basically design a curriculum for them that they could use during these antibiotic institution rounds. So this is what the intervention looked like. So that initial sort of those two slides um, that, we were, that we were given during the residence orientation, we basically um, used them to provide a refresher on the four moments of hand hygiene uh, and a refresher on what is the patient environment. So these were sort of very knowledge provision um, and also instruction on how to form the behavior and instruction about health consequences. We also wanted to get across the idea that this was important for the other hospital and also for the chief residents. And so we talked about uh, basically the concerns in the other hospital about you know, poor physician hand hygiene compliance and also our, you know, the issues we had with um, hospital acquired infections. Uh, and here we're sort of trying to get across the least about consequences and also you know, by providing information about health consequences. But also here you know, you know, using social influences um, because we thought the chief residents were highly credible source um, um, uh, 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 for residents coming into a, a new service. So that was part of our intervention. 
then in terms of the work that we did around the antibiotic stewardship, we basically developed an eight-minute curriculum that we suggested should be delivered at two minutes a week over a four-week block, which would allow you to have a full rotation of uh, medical residents going through. And we've specifically in there wanted to talk again about um, information rates, the four moments, and the patient environment. So we are, one of the kind of issues that come up is that um, you know, clinicians who uh, uh, went into, say, a, a patient's room but didn't touch the patient, so said, well, yeah, I'm not interacting with the patient environment, and therefore I don't have to wash my hands. But they'd be touching the chart, they'd be leaning on the patient's bed, and we had, you know, one of the key issues was saying, well, the patient environment is you know, the, the total physical environment the patient is based in, so that if you are going to look at the chart or whatever else, you need to, to, to wash your hands. And we also added a glow germ demonstration. So this is a demonstration where you get people to uh, um, wash their hands with a, with a gel that when you then put the hands under um, an ultraviolet light shows where they're missing places. So it's a very good feedback mechanism about thinking about how to improve your skill in hand washing. And as I said, that was delivered by, again, um, was delivered by local experts and opinion leaders that we thought had a lot of credibility. So we ended up, we, we could have, built a Rolls-Royce. We could have built the most beautiful intervention that you could have actually thought about. But the message we got is that we could, it would never work because it just couldn't, you know, you wouldn't get the engagement of clinicians. It wasn't integration to their workflow. And so there's very much these available, you know, all logistical issues that then drove what we could do. But hopefully you also get a sense that we're trying to be, um, you know, coherent with uh, uh, and aligned with a kind of a, uh, a uh, behavior change that needs to address the key barriers we'd identified. And we also did, you know, basically did some work on the, on the environment. And this is what we found. So the M1, M4, just is the, M1 is the first moment of hand hygiene, so washing your hands before you go into um, the patient environment. M4 is washing your hands when you leave the patient environment. And what you can see, the blue bars were changed pre-post in the control group, and the green bars were uh, the changed pre-post in the, uh, in the um, uh, intervention groups and both in medicine and surgery. Not very scientific, it was very much a local sort of uh, 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 improvement process, but it looked as though we actually improved um, um, clinician hand hygiene by, by our approach. I think we're going to hand back to Justin now. <laughs> I think you've heard my voice for a long time and you'll have heard it's a bit ragged, so I'm going to hand back to Justin just to close off. Great, thanks, Jeremy. So just a couple of take home messages from us from this webinar, and then I'll move on to the webinar series in general. So. Hopefully through this, um, this session, um, we've encouraged to at least consider um, looking at and using taxonomies, um, if only to start to promote a shared language and operationalization of the, the way in which we describe the strategies and techniques that are available to us so that um, when we mean feedback on, on a behavior, we all know what we're talking about in terms of the definition, for example. And also it may provide new ideas for different ways in which to um, develop um, a patient safety intervention so that, uh, for example, if you have the leverage of having an educational session or an outreach visit um, or even uh, along the lines of Jeremy's intervention, just a few slides, um, you have that, that, that basis or that method of delivery and these sort of tech, uh, especially the behavior change techniques taxonomy might provide some ideas of what to include within those uh, methods of delivery, um, which leads into um, the importance of clarifying the difference between what you deliver in terms of the strategies from how you deliver it. So even saying we're going to develop an app or a website um, or we're going to do some education doesn't quite tell you what's going on within those strategies and um, using taxonomies that allow you to unpack that might be helpful. Um, but also remembering that there is a broader evidence base of effectiveness of strategies in other settings and other contexts that we can draw from um, to uh, to support the selection of particular strategies and theory, uh, particular strategies and techniques. Um, um, but as much as possible, um, um, if we can, tailor to identify barriers and enablers by using things like the matrix to start to um, select fit for purpose strategies that are better bets than, um, than, than what we, we might assume by sitting around in a room um, to map them out. Um, so that's what we hope you got through, that we communicated through from this webinar. And just looking back to the webinar series as a whole, um, clearly patient safety remains a major concern for healthcare systems. That's why you're all on this webinar, why we're, why we're all here. Um, and over the course of the past few months, um, I hope we've communicated that implementation science is, is a scientific study. Um, it's interested in what 
determines uh, and what are the processes and outcomes of implementation. And that over the course of the past six months, we've convinced you hopefully that um, successful implementation of any patient safety program depends on someone changing what they do, often health providers, often patients, but possibly other people in the organizational chain, um, that we shouldn't jump straight to solutions, um, that there are no magic bullets, there's not one strategy that's going to work in all settings, and that because of that, insights from different, from different disciplines like the behavioral science might help us to optimize change programs and hopefully uh, increase their likelihood of success. Um, and hopefully avoid the pitfalls of um, taking a, an, it seemed like a good idea at the time, or a slaggy approach, so that um, not only within our own settings, within our own hospitals or, or, or context, um, do we develop an understanding, but we can start to promote shared understanding across settings, across um, cities, across provinces, across the country, and, and broader. Um, and that can only really happen if we're on the same page in terms of the, the, the theories that we're using, the perspectives and the, the terminology that, that, uh, that describe the strategies that we're using. So I hope, over the, or we hope, um, over the past few months in, the past, in these six webinars, um, we've communicated that. Um, and really, thank you for, for your attention over the past few months, and very happy to uh, consider any questions that you might have. Wow, fantastic. Thank you so much, Justin. And of course, thank you, Jeremy, for that incredible presentation and for all your time and expertise in the entire webinar series. Rolls Royces and legs of lamb, hey. <laughs> Remember that you can ask any questions that you have for Jeremy or Justin in the question and answer box, and right now we can address a couple of them that have come forward. Uh, the first question is actually for you, Justin. Um, you, noticed that the pro you noted that the process of identifying and prioritizing the barriers, but how do you do this prioritization process? Is there a tool to assist with this process or is it based sort of on your, the organization's ability to address the barriers that have been uncovered or guessed at? So that's, that's a great point. So it's a combination of those two things. So uh, in the past, in webinar five, I think Andrea provided uh, at least a, a starting point for a set of criteria that we tend to use based on the barriers that, that come up in terms of um, what are the most frequently mentioned barriers as they relate to particular domains, which, so that's one. Uh, the second is, are there particular domains where people have disagreement, disagreeing views, so there's variability in, in whether people think it's a barrier or enabler. Um, um, and then finally, if there's a particular emphasis on a, a given idea by a few individuals, so the advantage of possibly a qualitative approach in that way, uh, in that perspective of identifying barriers and enablers is that um, there may be, uh, we don't want to take an only a frequentist approach, we want to, there may be a, a particularly vocal spokesperson that represents uh, an unhighlighted uh, barrier that others may not be willing to highlight, but that one or two really emphasize. And so having a third criteria of if there's a particular emphasis, um, even from a few, um, they're worth considering. So that mm -hmm. gives us a, a short list. Um, or sometimes a long list, which then ultimately are, are taken forward to start to think through what strategies we can use to, to address those. But um, working with um, the, the the set the, the the actors that we're trying to, or the, the the actors that we're trying to, to work to, to change their behavior with um, to to understand, like Jeremy was talking through, what what is feasible, what is practical, where are leverage points. So it may be that there are certain barriers that because of our access and our leverage points we can't address. Um, and mm, yep. really we want to identify those as early as possible, and that's where taking a more uh, integrated tra knowledge translation approach and working with our stakeholders from the start allows us to start to think through, irrespective of our, our intervention, where are our, our, our ways in, so to speak. Yeah, where you can apply the maximum force for maximum return sort of thing. The feedback loop might actually give you some great, great ideas to be able to address the next steps as well. So that's excellent. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, next one's for you, Jeremy. <laughs> um, similar to the hierarchy of effectiveness, does that epoch taxonomy describe the level of effectiveness for each of the recommended interventions? Uh, I'll note that this came up before slide 36 hit the screen, but do you have some comments about that? Yeah, the epoch taxonomy is just a way of sort of, um, if you like, dividing the world or, or uh, 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 proposing a set of definitions for, working definitions for each of the interventions. So the epoch, tax, epoch taxonomy doesn't give you the effectiveness, but uh, um, also on one of the slides, uh, you know, we mentioned that epoch has something like 200 reviews 
um, that are either completed or ongoing. I think it's about a, probably 150 completed and 50 ongoing. So there's a lot of information out there that you can access relatively uh, easily and relatively quickly. Um, we did have a paper um, published in Implementation Science around about 2012 or 2013 where you know, we tried to bring all together you know, the, the findings from these various uh, reviews together and we can send the citation uh, uh, um, um, to you, Christopher, that maybe you can post alongside, uh, uh, alongside uh, uh, um, this as another resource for, for attendees. Oh, absolutely. That'd be terrific. Thank you. Excellent. Well, thank you, Jeremy. Um, I actually had a question from Sandra, um, and I don't know exactly how to emphasize this, so I will I'll ask it two ways, and you can answer it in either way. So, is it possible to train professionals to overcome barriers, or is it possible to train professionals to overcome barriers? Uh, Why don't you take that one first? Uh, uh, you, you, we were trying to work out. You, 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 you had a very subtle um, difference in, in, in emphasis, so we're trying to work it out. Um, the, well, the, I, I, mean, the, the, I mean, the answer clearly is yes, because we have lots of evidence Absolutely. that it's possible to, you know, basically for healthcare professionals to change their behavior. Uh, I think some of the issues are, some of those barriers might be very personal. If it's a skill issue, then I have to sort of basically address my skills. Quite often what we can do, though, is we can actually you know, modify the environment or the work processes to just make it easier for me to do something than not to do something. And so, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean the healthcare professional to, you know, to make a big change in, in terms of, you know, how they, you know, how they see the world where they're working, but it requires us at the, uh, at the organizational system level to say, actually, sort of, you know, one of the key barriers we've identified is, um, you know, the, the difficulties of, of getting access to uh, certain drugs on the ward how can we actually address that? So, 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 I mean, the solution sometimes will be around the individual clinician. Often mm -hmm. they're going to be um, uh, 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 also involved in the in the the workplace environment, the work processes, or a combination of both of those. Do you want to add anything? Yeah, yeah. yeah I think I'll just work out where the emphasis distinctions were as well. Uh, but I'm not sure I have much more to add beyond that. It's not a given that it, that we can change in every setting, but it's definitely doable. Um, for, for sure, and enlisting their support as champions will really help as well. So, I mean, I mean the other thing, sorry, just to build on that, is that um, you know, in general, healthcare professionals are highly motivated to try and provide the best care that um, that they can. So, yeah, and there's a whole range of things that get in the way of them actually doing that. But I mean, our experience is that often, sort of, um, you know, healthcare professionals are very open to change as long as you can sort of make this, you know, make any sort of uh, change process particularly relevant and salient to them, and you, you kind of, you try and make it, you know, embed it in their work processes to minimize the disruption of, of, of the change that you're trying to do. Perfect, all right, thank, thank you both for that. Uh, I believe we just have time for one more question. I'm actually gonna sort of throw it open to you two to uh, give us sort of future advice for organizations or individuals who want to learn more, what knowledge transfer courses would you recommend for beginners looking to integrate this science into their QI work? Um, that's a really good question. I, I, I'll give you a slightly different response before I try and answer the question. I won't ask Justin to do the answer to the question. I mean, one of the other things is that I, I think this, um, if we want to bring in more of these behavioral knowledge translation implementation science uh, uh, um, perspectives into our, our local quality and safety uh, um, activities, yeah, we may we, we might we, we want to think about what the skill set is, is that we have in our quality team, and it could be that you know one of the opportunities are to train up people who are in the team, or you know there's also increasingly a number of people who've been trained at a, either a master's or PhD level in these approaches or in, say, behavioral sciences that we might want to actively you know, bring into the team. So we're sort of starting to build some sort of expertise within the team around that. Um, there are, you know, depending on where you are, a number of courses that uh, groups that do um, uh, do this work. So, uh, for example, Justin, myself, uh, Jamie Brujo, uh, 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 just ran a course um, last week where we had a number of people from quality, local quality or, or, well, from across the country, but yeah, from, from quality teams or, or, or improvement processes. Uh, colleague Sharon Strauss in Toronto, uh, St. Mike's, also runs a series of courses. Uh, Melanie Barwick at Cam H um, in Toronto also does this. Uh, there's groups, I think, out in BC as well. 
Uh, there may be others. I'm kind of looking uh, if Justin's got yeah. others around that. Well, maybe maybe if I could just propose something. Uh, if you were to give that a little bit of thought and maybe put together a little list, maybe a five that you might recommend. Uh, we're just getting up to time, so I do want to respect the time of all of our attendees, but I don't want them to lose this information if they're interested. So maybe I could invite you to send a few resources to Gina, and we can post those along with the webinar. What do you think about that? Yeah, happy yeah. about that. That's great. Perfect. Thank you so much. So I do see that we're at time right now. We do want to respectfully thank Drs. Grimshaw and Frisso for sharing your time and expertise. And of course, thanks to all of you for taking the time to attend. We know how busy your day is, and we appreciate you choosing to spend time with the Canadian Patient Safety Institute. Please visit our website for a taped version of the presentation and to sign up for our digital magazine to be alerted about upcoming webinars on a variety of subjects. If you do wish to continue the conversation started in this discussion, please feel free to send us an email. We'll forward your comments and any questions you may have had that were unaddressed on to Drs. Grimshaw and Purcell. You should all receive Gina Peck's follow-up thank you email in your inbox shortly, and you can respond to that. So have a wonderful day, everyone, and we will hope to see you again soon. Thank you very much again, doctors. Bye. Thanks so much. Good luck. Bye-bye.